very interesting uh, discussion. <coughs> that is the first of its kind among the physicians in Mizoram. So uh, that uh, that will be uh, will be talking about this mitotin, the, uh, the treatment of the resistant ascites. So tonight our moderator will be Dr. H. Lauren Moya. So H. Lauren Moya is the, uh, I mean the director, I, I can I should say that director, and uh, I runs the, the Region Institute of Paramedical Science. And then he's a, a very active academician, and then he's actively involved in this uh, academic activities. He is also a consultant physician at uh, Azal uh, Hospital. So tonight our speaker will be Dr. Zoram Tanga. And Dr. Zoram Tanga is a director in the Cancer Institute, Azal. He's also a senior physician, uh, one of the most senior physicians in Mizoram. So let me invite Dr. H. Lauren Moya to take over as a moderator. Please, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salpia. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I will I welcome you all for today's evening webinar. Because of COVID, you all know we could not uh, we could have sit together at Isol Club or some other places for a close discussion. But anyway, with all the technologies, let's hope we have a good discussion. So tonight, as we uh, as you know, Dr. Roxanne was uh, said we are going to discuss about refractory ascites and its treatment with uh, midogen. So, uh, as we all know, the most common complication of cirrhosis is ascites, and then out of those, uh, portion of all cases uh, develop refractory ascites. And then 50 percent of those who develop 50 percent of those who develop refractory ascites dies within six months without the transplant. And then we have uh, like a management. What we have is recurrent ascitic type every two hours with diuretics, which is I mean uh, those who don't respond to diuretics is the refractory ascites. And then tips we have for systemic like peritoneal. Uh, venous sums we have but recent interest is preserving the circulator systems and then managing the ascites so we have a new molecule that is called methogen which is alpha 1 adrenergic agonist so i invite dr zoram tanga Ubaltea, to talk about the management of refractory ascites in relation with uh, Midogen. Welcome, Dr. Valtea. Thank you, Dr. Moitea. Good evening, everyone. As Dr. Moitea said, tonight the topic is management of refractory ascites. <clears throat> Can you see the slide? Not yet. <clears throat> Not yet. Come yes, come. Yes, come. Yes, come. Hmm. It's quite okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, management of refractory ascites. So we'll discuss this tonight under the following headings: pathophysiology of ascites. Refractory ascites, definition, causes, pathophysiology, and treatment. As we know, ascites is the most common complication in patients with cirrhosis. It develops as a consequence of a severe impairment of liver function and portal hypertension. The pathogenesis of ascites is, as we all know, 
We'll start again. Sorry, there was a problem with the internet. Now we are. Hmm. So theories of uh, scientists in portal hypertension. The one, as we said, is backward pressure due to the resistance in the liver, splanchnic bed vessel dilatation, overflow theory, and underfilling uh, arterial underfilling theory. So what we have is portal hypertension due to fibrosis of the liver. Then nitric oxide, though it is increased in the systemic circulation, locally in the portal vein, it is decreased. So there is also vasoconstriction. So that puts pressure on the portal venous system. Then nitric oxide, it is increased in the systemic circulation. So there is dilatation of the splanchnic circulation and there is pooling of blood. And due to this nitric oxide, arterial, uh, there is underfilling of the arteries, peripheral arteries. And this is sensed by the kidneys and the uh, renin and geotensin aldosterone system is activated. The sympathetic activity uh, is, uh, system is also activated and the antidiuretic hormone is also released. So overall we have ascites. And due to the splanchnic vasodilatation, there is more lymph flow to the liver also. All this contributes to the ascites formation in uh, cirrhosis. So how do you detect uh, ascites? Clinically, it is not very sensitive. You have to have about 1.5 liter of fluid in the abdomen to be detectable clinically. Then ultrasound abdomen is a very sensitive method for to detect uh, ascites. But if you have septations, fibrous trans, then possibly this is not due to uh, cirrhosis. Then grading of ascites. Grade one is detectable by ultrasound only. Grade two, you have symmetrical distension of the abdomen. Shifting dullness is present. Then grade three is marked distension with fluid thrill. Then facts on ascites. Total ascitic fluid protein is inversely related to the portal hypertension. As the disease severity increases, protein level decreases. This means that as the severity increases, there is more pressure. So more uh, pressure and the protein level decreases. The ascitic fluid is formed more due to the uh, pressure difference. Then SPB, uh, SBP, uh, tends to develop when the protein is low and usually more or less than one gram per dl in the ascitic fluid. So the less protein there is in the ascitic fluid, the more the chances of spontaneous bacterial per, uh, peritonitis. Then high concentration of macrophages are found in the fluid and sometimes you can have bloody ascitic fluid in about 2%. So treatment of ascites as we know is salt restriction. Fluid restriction is not usually necessary, but if the sodium, serum sodium is less than 125 millimole, you have to restrict the sodium also. Then uh, fluid restriction also, I mean. Then diuretics, furosemide and spironolactone are the mainstay of uh, diuretics. Furosemide you can give up to 160 milligram and spironolactone up to 400 milligram. Though uh, some book says up to 600 milligram you can give. Like Harrison says up to 600 milligram. So approach to cirrhosis with ascites, diuretics, there are two ways of giving. One is spironolactone you increase from 25, 50, 100, 200 up to 400 after every uh, three, four days. If there is no response, you can add furosemide 40 milligrams increment every two days till you reach 160 milligram. Or you can start both simultaneously, then progressively increase till you reach a dose of 160 furosemide and 400 of spironolactone. That is the maximal dose. But this also depending on the size of the patient because a six foot Caucasian and a below five foot Asian, the dose cannot be the same. Anyway, 
once you have reached the dose maximal dose and the ascites is not controlled then that is the stage where we have the refractory ascites so what is refractory ascites refractory ascites is ascites due to cirrhosis in oh, yeah. that yeah. cannot be mobilized with treatment with a treatment regime regimen consisting of dietary sodium restriction usually two gram per day and oral diuretics as we said spartan electron 400 milligram and furosemide 160 milligram or early recurrence within four weeks after large volume paracentesis large volume paracentesis they mean paracentesis of about five liters so if it recurs again within four weeks or if the maximal dose of diuretic cannot control it that is when you say you have refractory ascites and as dr moite has says uh, it is a very grave sign because once you have refractory ascites 50 percent die within six months and in one year of 75 percent of your patients will die so refractory ascites is again classified into two types one is diuretic resistance so when do you call it diuretic resistant you give the maximal dose of furosemide and spironolactone as we have said <coughs> with restriction of two grams per day for four days and if the patient does not lose weight by 200 grams per day that is diuretic resistant or in the last line it rapidly recurs after therapeutic paracentesis within four weeks this is type uh, diuretic resistant ascites then the next is diuretic intractable ascites in this ascitic fluid cannot be mobilized or it recurs it cannot be uh, recurrence cannot be prevented due to diuretic induced complications that preclude use of effective diuretic dose in this you cannot use the the diuretics to the maximal dose because of some other side effects complications like hepatic encephalopathy the diuretic may precipitate hepatic encephalopathy or creatinine increases or the sodium level decreases or the potassium level decreases or the potassium level increases so due to various factors you cannot use the maximal dose of diuretics so this second one is called diuretic intractable ascites so once you have refractory ascites you have after sodium restriction and diuretics what do you do there are various conservative measures like beta blockers should you stop them add vasoconstrictors v2 agonist albumin infusion these may help but usually one has to resort to non-conservative measures so we'll discuss these things non-selective beta blockers so you we usually give them to <coughs> lower the portal pressure <coughs> but administration of beta blockers to critically uh, decompensated patients especially those with refractory ascites can be dangerous mainly due to worsening hmm. it can uh, worsen, uh, worsen the systemic hemodynamics and cause renal failure or severe infection and increases mortality so they have formulated a window hypothesis which states that yeah, when to use uh, beta blockers it claims that Cirrhotic patients benefit from the use of NSS beta blockers within a narrow window. That is from the appearance of risky oesophageal varices up to the appearance of refractory ascites or bacterial peritonitis or hepatorenal syndrome. So uh, they say you, have, you can use beta blockers only during uh, this small window when oesophageal varices, uh, risky oesophageal varices appear up to appearance of refractory ascites or bacterial peritonitis or hepatorenal syndrome 
but recent studies have uh, seen that they do not impair survival so much. So, but you have to discontinue them when their mean arterial pressure is low, and then you can uh, restart again. And propranolol has been proven to ameliorate the gastro duodenal or the intestinal permeability to reduce bacterial translocation. So this is the, another action of beta blockers. They reduce the permeability of the intestine for uh, the, the, and they reduce the bacterial translocation through the gut. So a comprehensive review was done by Blasco and Algora and they summarized it like this. Uh, uh, and this is uh, beta blocker should be withheld as follows in child C or male score more than 25 and diuretic intractable refractory ascites number two cardiac index less than 1.5 then systolic pressure less than 90 or number four, within six months of the first episode of SBP, as long as hemodynamic deterioration is sustained, that is BP less than 90 or the cardiac index is less than 1.5 liter. The author further recommends that the maximal dose of propranolol should be set at 40 to 80 milligram if patient's melt score is 18 to 24 because high beta blocker dose is associated with more harmful effects. So you have to be careful with beta blockers, especially in the later stage of your cirrhosis. Then we, after beta blockers, we can use the vasoconstrictors, midodrine. Uh, midodrine is a selective uh, alpha-1 adrenergic agonist. It is approved for the treatment of symptomatic orthostatic hypertension in 216. With clinical evidence, it can be used for refractory ascites and hepatorenal syndrome. Onset of action is one hour, time to peak serum concentration is one to two hours, half life is three to four hours, and duration of action is two to three hours. That is the effect of midodrine, systemic hemodynamics, and the renal hemodynamics. So, as we will some uh, midodrine is, um, it can be al uh, used alone or with octetride and albumin and with other drugs for better control. Oral midodrine of 7.5 milligram thrice daily has been reported to prolong patient survival. Latest ASLD practice guidelines recommend that it is a simple medical treatment option preceding LVP or TIPS. So this is the ASLD practice guideline, which states that oral midodrine, this is 2012, has been shown to improve clinical outcomes and survival in patients with refractitis. Its use should be considered in this setting. So it increases the urine volume, increases sodium, increases mean arterial pressure, and increases survival. This is another SLD practice guideline recommendation. Albumin infusion plus administration of vasoactive drugs such as octreotide and midodrine should be considered in the treatment of type 1 hepatorenal syndrome. So it is also seen to be more effective versus dopamine and albumin infusion. And this treatment, which they have elaborated here, octreotide, midodrine, it can be given at home also. You don't have to go to the ICU. So this has been uh, recommended by the ASLD. And here is another report of the beneficial effect of midodrine in hypotensive cirrhotic patients. Here there are two case reports. Patient number one, a systolic BP of 73, had been going paracentesis. So in the last two months, nine paracentesis with 57 liters, which has been removed. So after taking midodrine, his BP went up to 102, 
and the frequency of the percentages drop from nine to four and the total amount of fluid month is 11 liters only from 57 liters to 11 liters and the next patient also from 45 liters to 19 liters so it increases the systolic bp reduces the frequency of paracentesis and significantly reduces the sciatic fluid volume so it did definitely help though it did not cure so there are other studies here in the first one with refractory ascites, midodrine is given with standard medical treatment. It was shown to be better than standard medical treatment alone. So in this study, 7.5 milligram TDS with tolvaptan was better than standard medical treatment. Here also, it was with albumin, it was better than plain albumin alone. So it can be paired with different treatment modalities and it was seen to be better than the standard medical treatment. Then in HRS also, it was found to be useful with octreotide and albumin, more effective versus dopamine, octreotide and albumin, more effective versus albumin. So overall, this is a very good drug which can help reduce your ascites. Then the next is vasoconst uh, the first vasoconstrictor was midodrine. The next vasoconstrictor is tarlipressin. Tarlipressin is a V1 receptor agonist. As we know, antidiuretic hormone acts on the V1 and the V2 receptors. The V1 receptors causes vasoconstriction. So it improves the renal function and induces naturesis in patients with cirrhosis and ascites. <coughs> with refractory ascites. It increases water excretion during a water load test and has synergistic effect with of terlipressin and standard diuretic therapy. So you can add it to standard diuretic therapy. Then V2 receptor agonist. As we have said, antidiuretic hormone acts on two receptors. V1, vasoconstriction. V2 causes water reabsorption from the renal medulla. So V2 receptor antagonist will stop the water reabsorption. So there will be more free water clearance from the kidney. So like here, I think here we use it for our hyponatremic patients, Tolvaptan. Yeah. Uh, Satavaptan was used initially, it was thought to be effective, but higher rate of all cause mortality was seen and due to uh, due to this it was withdrawn now tolvaptan is used for this purpose it it lowers the dose of the diuretics used in cirrhotic patients when you combine with diuretics it has an effect to conventional diuretic therapy it is not very strong but it can be used to supplement other drugs then clonidine is alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. It has a sympathoinhibitory effect and suppresses the renin, aldosterone, and angiotensin system in patients with cirrhosis. It augments the effect of spironolactone facilitating an earlier diuretic response with smaller diuretic requirements and fewer complications. It decreases the plasma norepinephrine plasma renin and aldosterone level from baseline. But it is very costly. So other trials have been conducted. All shows that albumin is a good drug and it is shown to be superior to other plasma expanders. Dose is usually six to eight grams per liter of fluid removed. Five to 10 grams per liter of fluid removed. So these are the various medical treatments which can be given to patients with ascites and refractory ascites. So when these measures have failed, we go on to the next 
that is large volume paracentesis and tips and then ultimately liver transplant so large volume paracentesis is necessary when all the drugs have failed and the patient comes with a very very huge ascites so it is the first line of treatment for tense ascites pp for people who have a respiratory compromise and abdominal pain pressure secondary to tense ascites uh, routine uh, you have to discontinue your beta blockers and adding midodrine this regarding beta blockers we have discussed we may not have to stop in all patients also if the pressure and other things are normal contraindications are acute abdomen thrombocytopenia coagulopathy uh, <coughs> hepatic encephalopathy sbp creatinine more than 3 and hypotension it is fast effective and safe achieves but but the problem is it carries the risk of post paracentesis circular dis, uh, circulatory dysfunction or paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction that causes uh, reduce long term survival there is risk of bleeding and the plasma renin increases by more than 50% so you have to be very careful like we say <coughs> large paracentesis we mean about 5 liters at a go so when you take out this much of fluid sometimes you can get renal failure renal compromise then all these are called post paracentesis circulatory uh, this uh, function then there are other methods modified uh, large volume paracentesis one is indwelling peritoneal catheter through which you can remove small amounts uh, multiple times then it is almost the same as uh, lvp large volume paracentesis but with the catheter there are chances of infection then you have the cart this is cell free and concentrated acytic reinfusion therapy uh indications are refractory ascites in this what do they do is they remove the acytic fluid they separate the cells and then they concentrate the fluid and reinfuse it intravenously basically you are saving the albumin so it is not very common high cost and chances of infection are there then you have the peritoneal urinary drainage here also the same thing the peritoneal fluid is drained into the bladder by means of a small machine so you don't have to drain it <clears throat> but it drains automatically by itself but the problem is infection and tube failure and all and the price of the machine the next is the peritoneal uh, peritoneal venous shunts like the levin shunt is used here this is also very good but shunt problems are there shunt block or infection then last we have the tips i'm going a little fast because the net is very bad transjugular intrahepatic porto systemic shunt while we are mbbs students this was not there we used to, to talk of lyron uh, renal shunts inferior vena cava shunts major operation used to be done but now to shunt the blood from the portal vein to the systemic vein you can go through the jugular vein to the liver and shunts are created so it is the last resort before uh, liver transplantation indications are selected cirrhotic patients with refractory ascites who require more than 2 to 3 paracentesis per month a bridge to liver transplantation especially in patients with refractory ascites and hepatorenal syndrome contraindications are absolute contraindications are congestive heart failure 
tricuspid regurgitation, severe pulmonary hypertension, advanced liver failure, multiple hepatic cyst and controlled systemic infection or biliary obstruction. Uh, these are the, all the contraindications. The pros are it reduces recurrence of tense society as compared with LVP, improve the renal function, especially in participants with be, uh, baseline estimated GFR less than 60, improves renal perfusion and sodium excretion, controls society and reverses hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, so this is quite good but the cons are it, it induces hepatic encephalopathy because we are shunting the portal blood to the systemic vein so frequent shunt dysfunction is there associated with increased mortality in patients with severe liver dysfunction so what they say is tips changes the cause of cirrhosis from ascites to encephalopathy so when you have tips ascites is not the problem but encephalopathy can become the problem so here 1672 picture i think tapping had been done during that time also people have started tapping this and this is the tips the shunt is here this is the hepatic vein this is the portal vein and here is the shunt which they put through that vein. So this is the ASLD guideline 2013. Medical therapy, beta blockers, when you have refractory ascites, is contraindicated in hypotension. You give midodrine, <laughs> then urine output increases, urine sodium uh, uh, increases, mean arterial pressure improves, and then diuretic resistance becomes diuretic sensitive again this is i think we have discussed this with albumin and without albumin this people say this all though there is significant increase in renin increase in creatinine and electrolytes when you do paracentesis without albumin they say their morbidity and mortality is almost the same in this one study but People are very skeptical because we know, and there are other tests, uh, research, which says that albumin with albumin, it is far more superior. Then the role of terlipressin plus midodrine versus albumin infusion. What they do is they give terlipressin one milligram, eight hours later, they repeat that plus midodrine, five milligram TDS. Then on 16th hour, one milligram of terlipressin again. So this regime is equivalent to albumin infusion in suppressing renin. Then here is another study of 40 serotic patients with refractory ascites. Midodrine and standard medical therapy was given. And in one restriction of sodium, standard medical therapy, then large volume paracentesis plus albumin was given. The outcome was the control of ascites. So here, at one month, three months, six months, it was seen that the midodine green uh, group was superior in all aspects in the response. Complete response, partial response was superior in the first month, second month, and six months against the standard therapy and median survival was 90 days in the standard medical therapy and 365 days in the midodrine, uh, midodrine group so midodrine was far more superior than the standard medical therapy then there are other experimental treatments diuretic with salt ingestion though we have been talking about salt restriction in this they give a high dose of furosemide 250 to 100 milligram dd and hypertonic saline solution so but case selection has you have to be careful with the case selection these people should be hyponatremia those with hyponatremia and like 
side effects like uh, this spontane myelinolysis is there. So you have to be very careful with this. But some patient responded very well to this treatment. But as I said, okay, you have to be careful with your case selection. Then antibiotics. So increased inflammatory cytokine induced by gut derived endotoxin is considered to facilitate mesenteric vasodilatation. So here, overall, what happens is the cirrhosis, this biosis ratio, like beneficial bacteria to potentially pathogenic bacteria. This ratio is altered in cirrhosis. So the pathogenic bacteria increases. And they've also found that lactobacillus rhamnosus and a, um, in, a decrease in lactobacillus rhamnosus and a reduction is lactobacillus fermentus in the faces of patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So all this means that when you have got this biosis, the pathogenic bacteria multiplies and causes inflammation. These inflammatory products, inflammatory cytokines induced by the gut endotoxins, they cause uh, mesenteric vasodilatation, enhancing the reflect of cirrhotic ascites. So they, it has been seen that rifaximin helps in many patients. Also norfloxacin suppresses serum ascitic level of TNF alpha and nitric oxide in patients recovering from SBP. So uh, like our probiotic, many of the probiotic or other bacteria may be helpful in treating this resistant uh, ascites. Like a grad, uh, all these are the same. I'll just keep this. So overall, the therapeutic approaches, the quality of evidence and the strength of recommendation, repeated large volume paracentesis, a and one and tips quality of evidence is a and the strength of recommendation is one so these two are the mainstay after medical therapy fails so i will summarize with here we have a drug resistant diuretic intractable ascites so what do we do we add a vessel constrictors like a midodrine like a V1 agonist, V2 antagonist, we give albumin, we can give clonidine here. So when all this fails, we have to remove the fluid. So large volume paracentesis with or without albumin. So there are various modifications of this paracentesis, like we said, CART or indwelling peritoneal catheters, or peritoneal urinary drainage or the peritoneal venous shunts. Then we also have the tips. Then ultimately, we have to go for the liver transplantation. Side by side, you have to treat the causative disease. Like supposing you have viral hepatitis C, which can be treatable. Once you treat this, patient can improve again. And th this is the last resort. And here, I think we have many patients in Mizoram also who have undergone liver transplantation. It is the definitive treatment for patients with decompensated cirrhosis. Patients with cirrhosis are typically candidates for liver transplantation once their MELT score is 15 or more. However, transplantation evaluation is typically started once a patient has a MELT score of 10. So we have to start referring to gastroenterologist at this stage. This permits the patient to meet the transplantation team prior to developing end-stage liver disease and ensures adequate time for the patient to complete the pre-transplantation evaluation. So when to refer a patient? Referral to a hepatologist is recommended if the patient develops decompensated cirrhosis or major complications like your refractory ascites, like your SBP or HRS.
Patient with MELT score more than 10 should be referred to a liver transplantation center for evaluation. And in addition, referral to a pathologist should be considered if the patient requires treatment for underlying causes of the cirrhosis, for example, hepatitis C, autoimmune hepatitis, or if the clinician managing the patient would like the assistance of a hepatologist in the patient's general management. Thank you, and sorry for the net problem. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Valtea. Yeah, sorry, all my colleagues, because of a net problem. And that was a good presentation. And when we come to a talk about uh, midodrin, I think uh, the, the good thing is that it increased the urinary volume, urinary sodium excretion, and then maintain mean arterial pressure. And then sodium excretion is good. So there are six questions, which are, number one is, uh, in severe ascites, should we start with 7.5 milligram TID dosing? Dr. Valtea? It is better to start from a low dose, 2.5. Okay. So okay. probably you can gradually increase from there. You can yeah. go up to 12.5 milligram yes. hourly. Okay. And then the next question is, how long the 7.5 milligram dosing need to be continued? I think you can continue. Hello. Can you hear? That will depend on the response of the patient. You can continue yeah. on that and if the patient is improving a lot, you can start decreasing to five also, if the, you can still manage on that. So you'll have to titrate according to the response. Yeah, oh, or we can increase the 7.5 to 12, 10, 12.5, and uh -huh. once they sometimes they become diuretic responsive. Yeah, they become diuretic responsive. Then I think we can go back to uh, diuretics alone. Also. And then, uh, Next question we have here is, uh, in combination with albumin, what should be the dose for midodrin? What well, can you hear? See, there are no fixed, ah, there are no fixed dose for that. You have to titrate. Yeah. First, usually we start from 2.5 or you can, depending on the size of the patient also, so best you start from 2.5, then gradually you can go up. Okay. And albumin, uh, see, this is the amount of ascites you have. So you can give albumin at the rate that say six to eight, usually they give of uh, grams per liter of fluid removed. So with that also you can give daily, sometimes we give daily, Sometimes we give weekly, depending on the serum albumin. So all this has to be titrated according to the patient condition. Okay, we have some, uh, some more questions. Uh, do you suggest to measure the plasma renin activity? Number one is that will be a problem here. Yes, if we can measure, that will be good because these things tell yeah. us what is really happening inside. But will it really guide us? That I cannot say. Guide us in our treatment. Okay. Okay. And another question, if patients develop LDP refractory, then what should be? the ideal treatment option, Dr. Pakhai. So if you are refractory to LVP with all your albumin, your everything, tips of transplant is the only option, I think. Okay. Any other, co any, any comment from the house, from the audience? Hello? And one more question, 
if patient is having a history of hepatitis C, but after completion of so for Velpa six months course, her viral load is become zero simultaneously two times. Then she develop with ascites. What would, should be the prognosis? Can we start with dodgin in such case? Ah, I think we can start hepatitis C free. No, but the thing is, first you have to prove that this is refractory ascites. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we should first start with the diuretics. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, another question. Uh, uh, minimum course duration for midogen in refractory societies, comma HRS. Minimum. Course duration for midogen in refractory cost. societies. Cost you aman moiti. Yeah, course, course duration. Duration. Yeah. duration. How long? Course of treatment. Course of treatment. How long? Cost of treatment. Can you cover it? Can I The cost presently, I think the company people can tell us now. I think we are getting two plus one free. Five minutes of ten thousand. Yeah, people try three months of this. After three months or so, they found the result very good. Hello? Are the two want to speak? Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? Oh, I think I'm going to sit here. Yeah, hello. Oh, hello. Yes, coming in. Oh, hello. Hello. Can you hear? Oh, Hello? Data. I can hear you. Oh, oh, oh. Any, uh, so, any more, uh, any other questions, any other comments from the members? And uh, anybody would like to share your experience on this Midodrin? Please, you're welcome. Uh, Dr. Zoram, so there is one question which has been posted in the uh, chat option uh, by Dr. Ali. So yeah, the, he is asking which side effects should be monitored if we start midotrin. Dr. Zoram, can you hear? Uh, can you hear? What is it?
हेलो हेलो सर आई थिंक गॉट डिस्कनेक्टेड यू ऑडिबल सर प्लीज कंटिन्यू हेलो या I think we have to watch out for this uh, hyponatremia one thing, as always. As what the? Can you come back? Hello. Oh, hello. Yeah. The question was, what side effect should we watch out for when we give midorin? Acha. So. Can you hear what there? Yeah. Ah, we have to monitor the pressure, blood pressure, because it can increase the blood pressure. Then you can have some urinary retention also. I think pressure. You have to. That is the most important thing. Hello. Hello. Ah. Sir, we can hear you, sir. Oh, hello. Yes. Pressure. I. You have to wait. Watch for the blood pressure. You sit here. Yeah, we can hear. Yes, sir. We, we can, can hear, hear you, Doctor Lal. Yeah. Is there any other questions? You can type also. I think all the type questions. I think we've gone through it. Hello. Hello. Sir, we have few more questions in Q and A section. Yeah, I think I've gone through. Yeah. Oh, just hold on, just hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was uh, the question was uh, how, with Midodrin, how to monitor the patients regarding blood test and any other investigations, right? Blood test. Uh, I'm not aware of. Hello. Uh, I'm Hello? not aware of specific blood tests for midodrin. Anything I missed? Hello. Oh, hello. Yeah, can can we hear you? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. I can hear. Doctor Mohinder, you are audible. Please continue. The computer is. Oh sir, have you started using midodrin at Aizol? Yes, we have started on a few patients. Oh, how is the response, sir? Ah, uh, okay, good. Oh, okay. oh, so how long uh, you have been using? Means in one patient, like uh, you have used and stopped. About it four or five time? patients, about two three months now. Okay, sir. Okay. Like uh, any improvement or uh, all patients? Ah, uh, some improvement is there on on our patients. Okay, sir. Then any deterioration? Ah, uh, that I have not seen. I think I have used it in about three, four patients. Oh, sir. Um, they are they are doing good. well with that. Okay, very good. Sir. Yeah. So the maximum dose may be twelve point five TDS like that, isn't it, sir? Uh huh. The maximum dose. Yeah. But in one slide, I yeah. think I saw fifteen milligram TDS like that. Maybe ah. You know, uh, Some are in their trials, but the, some of the books they say up to forty. You don't cross forty. Forty milligram per day. Okay. Okay, sir. So, when will be the best time to start with the drink in the refractory cystitis after trying uh, all those? No, after I think it will be. After you, your diuretics fail. Okay, sir. So two point five milligram TTS, then titrate accordingly. Ah, titrate accordingly. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. 
a nice presentation sir yeah any other any other questions and comment from the house hello i think we better have a frequent uh, of yeah. this type but yeah the i want to say one of my experience with midodin one of my patients he have a hepatic hydrothorax mm -hmm. and then he had ascites also he was so obese he is a schizophrenic also so it's very difficult to follow him i uh, i started with dotin 5 then 7.5 and i went up to 10 10 mg tds oh after two weeks he responded very well mm. but like yeah. i say he's a schizophrenic so follow up is very difficult <coughs> so now he's lost on follow up so samoyte ya with midodrin are you still giving the diuretics no okay okay any other questions comment See, midodrin is very good drugs. It's very effective. Only problem is the cost is very costly. Mm -hmm. Not all patient, not all our patient can afford it. Only some selected mm -hmm. patient can afford. And then the duration of the treatment is not short. It has to be a quite long duration of treatment. Otherwise. clinically is very effective mm -hmm. you can try it is very effective and i find it very safe also do it is very like uh, very rare we may be having some hypertensive so regarding that can you still use yeah doctor pc is a good one yeah doctor balte yeah Doctor PC has a question: The how long should we wait till we reach the maximum dose? Hello. Is that time about it? Tomorrow. I have to go to the doctor. Let me write it down. How long should we wait till we reach the maximum dose? Uh, from the start. Yeah. Oh, actually, actually, I'm not very sure of that answer. How long we should wait? But at least I think to reach to titrate up to the maximum dose, one to two weeks, I think. I think. But that also will depend on the patient. I'm not very sure of that question answer. Yeah, midodrine is quite safe because when we treat the like a uh, ascites with diuretics or lvp what we have to take care the most worrisome is a post paracentesis circulatory dysfunction and maintenance of the hemodynamics that's where midodrine comes up in my practice i use three four days to titrate the dose hello mm -hmm. oh, just three four days Yeah. Oh. Okay. Three four days. I uh -huh. I take the dose. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, sir, how how we monitor the response then? Three four days means the weight of the patients, the waist. urinary output, circumference, yeah. weight and waist circumference, weight waist circumference like that. Okay. If it's indoor patient, waist circumference is possible. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. Mm. At at home is very difficult. Yes. Oh, they measure so yeah. difficult. Yeah. Weight. Yeah. Urine output. Weight and weight. Okay. Okay. Urine output and weight and the well-being also. Once they respond, they their well-being is better. They are more yeah. alert. Okay. Yeah. So any qu any questions from the from pc lal bompuya everyone midodrine may not be effective pc ah you want to speak dr pc ah uh, 
Uh, I request Please audience see. if uh, there is any query you can unmute and yeah, ask can... directly. Yeah, hello. Yeah, oh, hello. Please yeah. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, how long are we supposed to try, keep on trying? Because it doesn't mean that it is effective in all patients. Because some patients yeah. may may not work at all. Right, right. Yeah. So when do we? How long are we supposed to try that methadone? Suppose I give it for full dose for how long? For three weeks. So when do I give up using it? So when do I say that this methadone is not effective in this patient? Because it seems that because it cannot be used uh, if be effective in all patients. So there might be some subset of patients that are not effective at all. So it, we oh, may be using right. it. It is very uh, It's not written here for two days. You give three, but usually I think you have to use a clinical equity because yeah. if they are res not responding, some uh, their ascites may increase, breathlessness may increase. So if you don't want, also sometimes uh, urgently you have to try something else. So, but usually, yes. if nothing else otherwise happens. Uh, one to two weeks, you can see if that there is no change. I think that should okay. uh, you, you can change the treatment. But in the meantime, if the patient deteriorates or something, that means definitely it's not effective, and you have to start something fast. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think yeah to reach a maximum dose of twelve point five TDS until and unless we reach that stage. It is difficult to decide that the patient is responding or not responding. So it may take a month. Yes. Yes. Hello. So I was just asking yeah. if there is any fixed yeah, duration, for example, objective. <laughs> no so fixed try because it's because of, for example, antibiotic yeah, we try for usually forty-eight hours or seventy-two hours to see the response. Yeah. So we have a time frame. Yeah. So yeah. in the kind of scenarios, yeah. so if it's the tightest. When do I give up? <laughs> so, <laughs> Hello, is here. Yes, hello. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Any other comment? Uvaltia, mm -hmm. you want to say anything? No, no, I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. Due to poor connectivity, sometimes uh, meeting was disrupted, even then with a good meeting. So I thank you all of you and then all of you. So I hope we keep having this type of meeting in this COVID pandemic area. So I thank you all. So I'll close the session now. Thank you all.